when you sin, and you will sin, and here's your salvation, repent to him and him alone. Go back to a law. Make tawbah, like a U-turn in the middle of the street. Go back to a law. Raise your hand up to him. A law. A law. Forgive me. I'm sorry. I did it to myself. I'm wrong. La ilaha illa ante subhanaka in kultum mi midalameen. That's Islam. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. On behalf of Guide Us TV and the team of Sheikh Yusuf Estes, it is indeed a great honor to be here with you again tonight at the American University of Beirut. Well, alhamdulillah, you've given us a reason to go through customs, inshallah ta'ala, with ease. Because when we tell them that we came to visit American University, they say, okay, alhamdulillah, no problem. How many of you were here last night? My, you guys are gluttons for punishment. Allahu Akbar. There's one person I don't see that was here last night. He wasn't a glutton for punishment. I see we had uh, our brother Ali opening the... What happened to our brother? He had too much, huh? Y'all beat him up too much last night. Allah Akbar. Is he here in the house? Is he here? Uh, no, he has an exam. Okay, alhamdulillah. He has an exam. We have some good news for you. Sheikh Yusuf, alhamdulillah, was not able to visit the grotto of uh, Jaita this morning. And so that means you have to come back to Beirut, inshallah. So make dua, inshallah. <laughs> well, alhamdulillah, how many of you have family members in the United States of America? Allahu Akbar. MashaAllah. So we are one family. We want to ask you to tell your family members in America about Guide US TV. This is the first authentic Islamic channel in North America. No other channel broadcasts 24 hours a day, seven days a week from the satellite, from two satellites, alhamdulillah, other than Guide, did I say US TV? I mean Guide Us TV. <laughs> But I think the U.S. needs guidance too, doesn't it? Does the U.S. need guidance? Yeah. Alhamdulillah. We discovered the great need for the Muslim Ummah in the West to have a voice after we visited the United Kingdom and completing a documentary for the Water for Life Project in 2009, having visited the bordering region of Ethiopia and Somalia called Mandera in Kenya. And when we went to the United Kingdom and found a, prolifer a proliferation of t television stations owned and operated by Muslims, we were, we were really very excited, but at the same time taken aback by the fact that the Muslim population in the United Kingdom is dwarfed by the population of Muslims in the U.S., but yet they have many voices for Muslims in the U.K., whereas in America we had not a single one. Well, praise be to Allah, Last December 2010, we were able to launch Guide Us TV from Chicago. And we have just completed a year of broadcasting, and it has been an amazing experience. And this visit here will be a part of the coming year's experience with Guide Us TV, inshallah. You all have been so gracious, and we have really, really been very, very excited to be here with you here in Lebanon. In fact, I'm going to tell you a little secret. We're very apprehensive about coming. Up to the last day, the Sheikh was saying, maybe we better rethink our plans and not go. But alhamdulillah, we have a way of kind of nudging him to stay the course. <laughs> and so he's been with us for the entire week, and he's enjoyed it immensely. So we're looking forward to seeing this and other programs from Lebanon being broadcast on, uh, on tape delay uh, in the very near future, inshallah ta'ala. And those of you, of course, you cannot get the satellite signal over here. You can get it on, on the internet at www.guideus.tv slash live. And we have an iPad, iPod uh, access, so if you want to download the iPod application, you can watch Guidance TV from your pocketbooks or from underneath your khimar, like the sisters like to stick their phones up in the khimar, alhamdulillah. So inshallah ta'ala, 
we are looking forward to a very, very wonderful evening as the Sheikh addresses the, con the, uh, the topic, Misconceptions in Islam, and inshallah ta'ala, after which we'll have time for question and answer. So without any further delay, I bring to you our dear beloved Sheikh Abdallah Sheikh Yusuf as the Salaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullah. In Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, who Allah the Jalal the Muslimin, with Salat wa Salam ala Rasulullah wa Kareem wa ala Alihi wa Sabi ajma'in, ashadu ala ilaha illallah wa atala shariq Allah wa ashadu Muhammadin abduhu wa rasul. Wa salam alaykum. MashaAllah. On the way over tonight, I said to the brothers with me, most likely there won't be anybody here. They said, why? I said, well, we were there last night. So why would they come back tonight? So but then I found out it was free. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So that's on the occasion when we can offer double your money back if you're not satisfied. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. The subject tonight, though, is a very serious one and doesn't really leave a lot of room for humor or entertainment because it is something that is a cause for discrimination and a cause for aggravation and a cause even for confrontation. I use three words with Asian at the end of it. Did you note that? <laughs> oh, good. We'll make some poetry tomorrow. The seriousness, though, is that when people have the wrong ideas and spread those wrong ideas and begin to accept those wrong ideas as if they were fact, this causes some very serious problems. Mushako Kabira. Can I say it like that? All right. Mushako Kabira. Big problems. And these are some of the things that we find in the news, the media, on the internet. You see it in television, hear it on the radio, read it in the newspapers. To the extent that even some Muslims begin to doubt their own religion. Even some of our boys and girls who write email to me, they will ask these questions as if it was a fact. Maybe some of you have encountered, maybe some of you have come across some of these misconceptions. And that's our subject tonight, the misconceptions about Islam and Muslims. Earlier tonight, I was presented with a list of questions for a television interview. We didn't use all of them, but as I was going through the list, I saw one and it said, how do you respond to the statement, I'm glad I knew about Islam before I met any Muslims. Have you heard that? Do you understand the context of this? I'm glad I learned Islam before I met Muslims. Well, actually somebody really said that. In the 1970s, if I'm not mistaken, that's when Cat Stevens, the musical singer from England, entered into Islam by reading the Quran in translation to English. And he was actually trying to follow Islam even though he'd never even been in a mosque. Then later when he met Muslims, and encountered some difficulties with those Muslims, some problems, he made the statement, I'm glad I learned about Islam before I met the Muslims. And I'm very sorry he had that experience. But that is not my experience. I would probably not be here today talking to you if I had just read about Islam. In fact, 
I think it was in the 19, early 1960s that I read about something of Islam in a Sufi book. And as I read it, there were a lot of things in there that made sense, but it had no real depth to it for me because I couldn't imagine anybody practicing this way of life. And I didn't even go forward with it. It was because I met a Muslim, worked with a Muslim, did business with a Muslim, lived with the Muslim in our house, that I was highly influenced to what Islam is because he practiced it. So before we go even into the subject of the misconceptions, I would like to deal one of the, with one of the biggest misconceptions that Muslims have about themselves. Is anybody in this room as a Muslim? Raise your hand. Is anybody in this room is not a Muslim? Raise your hand. Anybody else? Hold on, hold on. You have to hold it up because. Okay, how do you like being surrounded by all these terrorists? Oh, Muslim. <laughs> Misconception number one. No, we, we really appreciate you coming and being with us tonight. Thank you for coming out, spending your time with us. Thank you very much. But as to those who did raise their hand as being a Muslim, I'm going to ask you a serious question. Do you know what it really means? Because it says on your passport, or in some countries they have a comma, says Muslim, hmm? choice of religion, Muslim. Huh? When you fly on an airplane, what kind of food do you want? Muslim food. huh? But just because you say it doesn't make it true. As a Christian, when I was a Christian, we understood you're not really a Christian unless you truly follow Christ. Otherwise, you're just saying it. Right? And the same is true with the Muslim. You, you could say you're a Muslim, but if you don't do aslama, how can you be a Muslim, because the verb, the action, Islama, carries the meaning of surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace. It's the peace that you have with the Almighty when you do the other things relative to this beautiful word, Islama. So because it's a verb, in order to be the one who does it, in English, we put er after it, like walk er, talk er, think er, stink er. No, wait a minute. Oh, time out. Er. In Arabia, and you know this, I think everybody here knows Arabic a lot better than I do, that when you have a verb, the one who does that verb, we put mu in front of it. Right? Mu, like a cow. You know? <laughs> Seriously. Somebody is traveling in Arabic. You say, suffer. Suffer is travel. And sometimes when I travel, I suffer. Thank you for laughing. <laughs> that sounded like it was out of pity. <laughs> but when... Oh, you know what? There's a word in English that comes from the safari. You know the English word safari comes from safar, from Arabic. So when somebody is traveling, you put mu in front of that. He's musafar, right? Musafar. The same is true of the Adhan. We just heard the Adhan just a few minutes ago from Agra. The one who called it is called a Mu'adhan, right? Mu'adhan calls the Adhan. And there's something called Salah, from Sibla, connection. The one who does that, Musalli. Huh? 
the one who prays. So in order to do Islam, to become a real Muslim, you would have to do the actions so that you could be a real more Islam. That could be why, when you read some of the sayings, narrations, or a hadith of a, the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we find he is saying the one who has left the salah is not of us, laysa minha. He's not of us, because he left the salah. Today I was reading some of the hadith of Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he was saying that the one who is stealing, stealing, you know, a harami, when he is stealing, he's not a Muslim. When he is drinking alcohol, he's not a Muslim. If he's killing somebody, if he's doing anything that is the things that Islam tells you not to do, what he's doing, he cannot be a Muslim because he's not doing Aslama. So that could be why people like Yusuf Islam, Cat Stevens, and others have said, I'm glad I met Islam before I met the Muslims. But in my case, Allah blessed me to meet the average Muslim, the good Muslim, the one who is following this deen. And may Allah reward each and every one of you for following Islam. Ameen. I'm very proud of you. Another misconception that people have about Islam is, is it Usr or Yusra? Usr or Yusra? Which is it? How many think it's Usr? Difficult. Huh? How many think it's Yusra? It's easy. The concept is definitely easy. But some people make it very difficult. Yes or no? Yes. Very difficult. But what did Allah say about it? He wants for you ease, Yusra. And you shouldn't make it difficult. And those who make it difficult, really they're not following the true spirit of Islam. Not all of us have the same inclinations, capabilities, or mental factors. Some of us are weaker than others. Some of us don't have the intellect. Some of us don't have the advantage of knowing a lot of things. But we have a good heart. We want to do as much as we can. So it's not fair to lump us all together and say, everybody has to stay up all night long praying. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't like people to do that. And it's not fair to say you're going to fast every day. I can fast every day, just eat one meal at night, drink a water in the morning. I'm macho, watch me. But what about the rest of us? I mean, I'll fast in a, a day or so out of a week, it could be a lot for somebody. It could be. Some people might only like to fast one or two days in a month. And when Ramadan comes, it'll be pretty tough. And they get through it, it'll be like, Whew. but they still miss it, don't they, afterwards. You miss Ramadan when it's gone. But to come back to the subject, if you make it difficult, you scare away even the Muslims. And it never was supposed to be something that's so difficult that people can't do it. There are those amongst us who have an idea that everybody has to fit the same mold. Huh? If you don't fit this mold, you're not a Muslim. You heard people say things like that. I recently saw on the internet that Yusuf Estes is a Kafir. That's what it said. And how? They said, watch what he said. They took one of my lectures, a little piece of it, and stopped it before I finished the sentence. Ah, this is Kafir. If so they listen to the rest of the sentence, maybe they will change their mind. May Allah bless them to have a video machine that plays the whole thing. It's not about me anyway. This subject is something that affects all of us. Let's come now to some of the biggest misunderstandings, though 
from those that are not Muslim. When they say things like, Islam is terrorism. Now, that sounds really strange if you know Arabic and you know what it implies. You read even basic books about Islam from Muslims. You'd have a hard time believing that somebody would even say it, much less write it down. Even in a joke, it's stupid. The word, the etymology of this word, does not lend itself to that. The words that come out of the word Islama or Sium, the root, are nothing about aggression, oppression, or hatred, or any kind of dhulm. It's not related to it. Ma salama, the safety, the security, coming from this, right? Taslim and ah. Well, does that sound bad? No? Salam. Salam alaikum. That's nice. How oh, we get this? How? Oh. Because of what some people have done and some other people have exaggerated about and even implied that this was from our Prophet. Now we see where the problem comes from. So when somebody, and I was one of those somebodies, who believed this 20 years ago, because I heard it. This is what I heard. In the United States, we didn't have an option. You couldn't go somewhere and really meet Muslims. Well, today you can, alhamdulillah. But back then, there really weren't that many Muslims. There was one group called the Nation of Islam, but it was pretty far away from real Islam. Even some of those who converted over under Warthadeen Muhammad still were lacking a lot of things and it still looked like a black movement as opposed to a, you know, a holistic movement. So the idea that I had was what I got from TV. Exactly. All Muslims are terrorists, hijackers, kidnappers. They don't believe in God. They worship a black box in the desert and they kiss the ground five times a day. Well, that sounds pretty bad, huh? Hindus worship the ground and everything, but they don't kiss it. I mean, let's really think about that. No wonder they have a bad idea here. But then when you take it to the level of, oh, blowing up buildings, killing all the Jews, killing all the Christians, that's really gross. Then even going to the Quran and the Hadith and saying, oh, it says this, it says that, without putting things in context. Now, when I came to Islam, I had an advantage because I had seen many preachers do exactly the same thing with the Bible for a different purpose, trying to make a point. They would take verses out of context, parts of things that were not really related, and then some of them would even take things that were not in the Bible, but they were famous sayings and say it's in the Bible. But because people didn't read it, many of the Christians in America, they don't read the Bible. They don't even know where it is anymore. They go to church, the preacher says, the Bible says, that's how they always started out, you know. <laughs> the Bible says, and then they start telling you all this stuff. But I'd be sitting there going, wait a minute, I'll write that down, let me go look at it. I could never find it. If I asked the preachers about it, and I did, where is this? What does it matter? He said, no, where is it? No, but, you know, the Holy Spirit inspired me to say it. <laughs> and it's, by the way, it's wrong to think that all of them do that. They don't. These are just a few people. Again, it's not fair for us as Muslims to do that to somebody else. These misconceptions can spread faster than the truth itself. One of the questions that I just dealt with a few minutes ago in the television interview was the question about what is the biggest thing that Islam offers, value, what value does Islam offer that the West does not have? تطل عليكم بثوبها المتجدد جديدها لهذا العام صناعة الحضارة هو وهي شباب بنات 
نسمة حرية ربيع الشباب حكايا شبابية منبر الدعيات للكلمة الحرة عنوان Well, first of all, I'll, I will tell you the West has it. It's just very rare, okay? And Islam offers it, but not all Muslims follow it. So let's really clear it up before we say any more. Because the fact is, it's the word truth. The word truth. Now, this should be in every single language of the world. There should be something called truth. But what happens when the truth doesn't suit you? Or when the truth doesn't make you feel good? When the truth won't fill up your pocket? When the truth won't help you get what you want, then what's going to happen to the truth? That depends on the individual. That depends on the person and their moral conviction that they have. Allah says in the Quran, Ya yuladina amanu atakallah wa kullu kawlin sadida. Here the believer is taught that he must, as an obligation, wajib, to always say the haq, the truth, be of those who are sadaq, saying the truth. Additionally, though, it gets even more clear in the Quran that you must say the truth even if it is against yourself and your family. Whoa. Don't make any mistake. You don't have any excuse. Even in the three exceptions, supposed exceptions mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ, these are highly limited. And only when it won't hurt anybody. And that are the three occasions that between the man and his wife, between the two brothers or sisters in Islam who are fighting each other for no real reason, and an enemy comes and interrogates you and you don't want to say, oh, the Muslims are over here, you know. But even then, look how you have to do it. You can't, if your wife makes a meal, you know, she spent all day working hard, and you eat it and you go, And she says, well, what do you think? Well, you could say the truth. This is worse than garbage. But you're going to be sleeping outside. And maybe she's going to throw real garbage on you. It might be. So, so you can say, what do you think? I've never eaten anything like it before. And there's a line under that, and I never want to eat it again. <laughs> so in this way, that's a lie. But at least it's not the kind of lie that we're talking about where you are absolutely saying the wrong thing. What you're trying to do is keep from hurting somebody's feelings without showing that they hurt you. <laughs> Another one is between the two brothers. You know they're fighting. Then basically you're arguing over something stupid. Maybe they don't even remember what they're fighting about. But you want to bring some peace between them, some harmony. You can go to one and say, you know, so and so, he's a good guy. And he really likes you. He does? I thought he's mad at me. You know, this is ego, you know, nuffs. Probably you don't know, he's probably sad because you guys have been fighting. Really? You think? Then the other one, tell them the same thing. Same thing. Make a little bit of ease between them, you know. And then you invite one of them to come and have coffee. He comes, but you invite the other one too. So he comes. Oh, what are you doing here? Oh, hey man, how are you going? Oh. And you know, Muslims always shake hands. Maybe they'll hug each other. And maybe they'll say, you know, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. No, 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 forgive me. No, yeah. Because the Muslim, they have to forgive each other. In fact, you can't hurt anybody. If you hurt anybody, you don't enter Jannah until you resolve it. Did you know that? You can't enter Jannah. You thought you're okay. You, you, everything is all right. Salah is okay. Fasting is okay. I'm okay. Yeah? It's okay. 
But then on the day of judgment, this one, he's looking at you going, hey, you remember when you went like this to me or you took this from me or you did so and so? Give me my hawk. You can't either one enter till you resolve it. So this is why it's better to resolve it here. Don't you hear Muslims say, if I did anything or said anything, please forgive me. You hear that all the time. And you hear Muslims no, 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 you forgive us. It's serious. Now, what about this? How about how you treat a non-Muslim? Did you know it's even worse? Do you know why? Because if somebody is not scheduled to go to Jannah, then whatever you did to them, you're going to get it right here. Ooh. Ooh. And not only that, if you oppress a non-Muslim and they make dua against you, you're going to get it right away. It will not, there will not be any hesitation. <laughs> Just like that. Why? Because two things. One, it's their right because you did it. And you know better. The second one is, Allah does not like people praying to Him in the name of something else. If they're praying in the name of their favorite tree or rock or stick or stone or bone or human, live or dead, Allah doesn't like that. And He will give them whatever they want here in this dunya because they're not going to get any share in the akhir anyway. Did you ever wonder why Rich people get richer and richer and they do worse and worse, more bad stuff and they still get... Why? Because they all do some good deeds. Everybody does some good deeds. Even Prophet ﷺ said, nobody's perfectly good and nobody's perfectly bad. As for those who are bad in this life and Allah hates them, still the good that they did, He'll give them all of their reward here so they get nothing on the Day of Judgment. But for the ones who are really good, they're not perfectly good. They did some bad, so Allah will give them their punishment here. So they won't have to suffer on the day of judgment. This is a clear hadith. I shortened it because I didn't give you the story of the two people and all of it, but I think many of you heard it anyway. So for sure, Muslims must say the truth and must have the best akhlaq, the best behavior. If not, we will suffer here, and we will suffer on the Day of Judgment. Make sense? Yeah, okay. Now let's come to the misconceptions that others have and how we can deal with it. And go through that rather quickly, I hope. When people ask us, why the Quran says you have to beat your wives? Why does the Quran say, kill all the Jews and Christians? Before you start coming up with alibis and subjects, just hold on. I'm just going to give you the questions. Why do you worship a black box in the desert? Why do you force women to wear this rag on their head? Why do you force the children to pray? Why did Islam spread by the sword? These questions, you hear it, yes or no? A lot. And it comes like a fact. How are you going to deal with it? Because the problem we face today is nobody is really responding properly. The way the Prophet ﷺ would have responded would never have been to tell everybody to pick up picket signs and go to the streets and scream and holler. Okay, because on... Say on Facebook, let's take Facebook or YouTube, something like that. Somebody puts up a video or a story or an article and they're insulting the Quran or insulting the Prophet ﷺ, you know. And so here come the Muslims now. They're going to start a big campaign, right? They're going to put up the signs, the banners. They're going to go to the streets, you know, and chant and recite something, right? Huh? Oh, anyway. It's true or false? As soon as it's over, 
And I'm going to give you an example. It was the year 2000. In the year 2000, on, in the middle of September, I think it was September the 13th, I was in Malmo, Sweden, and on a tour up there. And while I was there is when Mohammed Dura, the little boy, you remember him? 13 years old, he was shot. You remember the picture that went everywhere, right? Now, where did that happen? Palestine, right? It was Palestine. I'm in Malmo, Sweden. This is, this is not very close. You knew that, right? It's not like a bridge you can go across. Far away. And the language they speak in Palestine is what? Arabia. Some people speak English. But not too many people speak the Swedish language there. Am I right? In Palestine. They speak Swedish? <laughs> okay. So in Malmo, Sweden, the Muslims, there's a lot of Muslims there, they went to the streets, they held up the banners, and they had everything in Arabic, huh? and the people screaming, and they had what you call a bullhorn. You know a bullhorn? You talk, make your voice out like that. Okay. And they had, they said maybe more than 5,000. More than 5,000 marching down the street. And I had my camera, of course, videotaping it, watching, trying to understand, why are you doing this? So along the way, I would stop the Swedish people on the street who are watching. I said, and I asked them, you speak English? Yeah. What's this? I don't know. I, I, I think it's Muslims. Yeah. What's it about? I'm, I'm scared. I don't know. <laughs> they don't know. Some told me they thought the Muslims were trying to take over Sweden. Some of their experts, some of their experts even referred to it later, said, see how the Sharia is? They're trying to take over. So there's a big misconception here. But is this what Rasul Islam wanted us to do? Now let me give you the rest of the story. I ask the only man that was in the demonstration. Why is it all women? He says, it's not. There's another man who's up there and there's two back over here. I say, you got 5,000 women though. Well, yeah. There's nothing wrong with our, our sisters who want to support it. Yeah. I said, and babies in the baby carriages. Why is this the women? He said, oh, the men are waiting at the, where we're going to end. They're all going to be there demonstrating. We got there. Sure enough, there they were. Now they got on their outfit, you know, with their around the look like Yasser Arafat. You remember the yeah, with this <laughs> said, I get it. You know why they got so much energy? They didn't have to walk in the parade. Because you walk five miles, you're tired, right? Let the ladies do all the work, and then the well, is this how it was. And then they get there. And then they tell the women, okay, go away. We got it covered now. Here we are, Mr. Macho. And standing on their vans and their cars, shouting, saying stuff, give speeches with a bullhorn. Again, I go around and ask the people, the Swedish people, what do you think about this? I don't know. I don't know. I'm scared. The Swedish government, listen to this, gave them permission, emergency permission to have a parade. Here, permission, free. And one thing, you want to have a place to gather to start? Okay, we're going to make sure this is safe for you to start. And a place to end at the end park? Only thing we ask, be careful of these 
statues and things that we have there because some are very old. It's part of monuments and things. Just be respectful of that and go ahead. One of the statues they had was some kind of a guy like, like this or something. And on the top was like a table way up. These Shabab, the young boys, climbed up on the top of that. That's bad enough, right? Just to climb up is bad, right? They took lighter fluid and squirted it all over the Najm Dawood, you know, the, fl the flag for the Israeli. And they took a mannequin looking thing, looked like human. Huh? I don't know who it's supposed to be, I don't think they knew either. And then they've set it on fire. I got it on tape. Uh, in those days we had tape. And even now I laugh. It's not really funny, but I laugh. Because when they were trying to start the fire, the thing wouldn't catch on fire, but they got so much lighter fluid on the top of the thing, the fire was under their feet. And they're jumping up and down trying to get out of the fire on top of that thing. So they give up and they threw the thing down, whatever it was, and somebody else is squirted this stuff all over it. He's all excited. And he set the fire. But he didn't know he got this lighter fluid all over his shoes. So his shoes are on fire. So he's dancing with his shoes on fire. <laughs> it's not funny, but it was hysterical. I don't know. This is not, this is not Islam. Not any of that is Islam. Because the focus and attention didn't show what the real problem was. And when it was over, as soon as they were finished, these guys went back home, took off all of their costumes, threw away their burned up shoes, and sit in front of the TV to see if they were on TV. And you have a word for that in Arabic. Aib. Aib. It's a big shame. But no part of that represented anything to do with Islam. And unfortunately, it was in every city around the world. The same kind of stupid mentality. If you said, we got attention. Yeah, you sure did. There's a lot of stuff you can do to get attention. And setting fire to yourself is sure one of them. There's no doubt about it. But it sure didn't make us look smart, and it sure didn't give the right impression about what Islam teaches. I'm very sorry that, that little boy got killed. Nobody can, nobody can imagine what it's like to have your child killed in such a way as that. But if you think about it, it didn't represent the teachings of Judaism either, did it? Because in the Jewish book, it does not teach you you can do that. In fact, it's very clear, says, you shall not kill. So just because somebody is Jewish and they did it, you don't blame their religion, do you? Do you? Be honest, because if you do, then they're justified to blame Islam for what you do. And the same is true about Christians. A person who practices Judaism or practices Christianity or practices Islam is basically following the same Sharia that came all the way back at the time of Abraham and Moses and Jesus. Peace be upon all of them. And it isn't right, it isn't proper for us to go out and accuse people of something and then get mad when they accuse us of the same thing. It's not right. Islam is about balance. You know Mizan, what's Mizan? It's really about balance. And if you tip that balance even a little bit, you can lose your perspective, you can lose your hidayah, your guidance. As much as you want people to be fair to you, you must show that fairness to others. As much as you want people to say the truth, that means you're more responsible to say the truth yourself. As much as you want them to look at themselves, then you must be willing to look in the mirror the same way. And if you can't do that, 
then you're going to be a part of the problem, not a part of the solution. His early companions and followers did either. But the way that some represent Islam, I'm talking about the Muslims, you can understand why a non-Muslim would get these ideas. Because they would say, oh, your guy said, and they said, and they said it's in the Quran. Huh? But it's not. All right, now I've given you some general things. Let's talk about specific, and then we'll take some questions, inshallah. Specifically, somebody comes to you, and they say, how come you're in a religion that, and then they could say whatever they want after that. Could be anything, all right? That does this or that. Forced marriages. You force little girls to get married. Huh? And beating your wives. Why do you have to beat your wife? How do you feel? You feel like, get out of here. My wife beats me. What are you talking about? <laughs> There is, there very much is a problem of some men beating their wives. That's true. Amongst Christians, amongst Jews, atheists, Buddhists, Hindus. Wait a minute. Muslims. Whoa, wait a minute. Everybody. It's a real problem. And that's the problem that should be dealt with. Not the problem of religion. It's the problem of men beating women. Let's deal with the real problem. If you said, well, they get authority to do that from the Quran or from the Bible or from this or from that, that still doesn't solve the problem. Because if the same man changed religion, he's still going to beat his wife, yes or no? So it's not going to solve anything to look at the religion. That's not the real problem. That just makes a second problem. Somebody tries to get an excuse to do what they do. But it's very simple. You could look at Islam and know. Just read it. It's forbidden in Islam to oppress anybody. You cannot damage anybody. You cannot even hit somebody hard enough to leave a mark without being in trouble with the law. So how could you understand any of this teaching to be that you could beat, hit, or kill somebody? It's because that's what you wanted to believe. That's why you believed it. Think about that. So how do I deal with it though? Now somebody came to me. I heard Yusuf Estes give a lecture. Okay, I, I can't react like I want to, you know. How come you can have four wives? How come you can have unlimited girlfriends? That doesn't solve anything. It doesn't solve anything. Just because you accuse them of having girlfriends, mistresses, doing adultery. There's, there's no law in America about how many girlfriends you can have. There's no law against it. Just don't marry them. <laughs> but if you said that, you're not going to solve the problem. That's not the way. Yes, you do need to understand what Islam is, what it was, how it came, what it implies. But the first and foremost thing is don't react because you're just going to start a fight. And you'll make a new problem. So how do I deal with it? Watch. How come you're in a religion that teaches you to force these little girls into a marriage they don't want? Thank you for asking me about my religion. <laughs> See this reaction? A man did this to me after a lecture in Toronto, Canada. Came up to me as I was packing up and he said, I do have a question. I said, Well, the question's over now. He said, No, just. How come you guys worship a black box in the desert? <laughs> Thank you for asking me about my religion. مع افتتاح عامها العشرين منبر الداعيات تطل عليكم بثوبها المتجدد جديدها لهذا العام صناعة الحضارة هو وهي شباب بنات نسمة حرية ربيع الشباب حكايا شبابية منبر الدعيات للكلمة الحرة عنوان
everybody to sit down again and we'll give him an answer. Slowly, step by step, and this is what we put on the internet. You can go there now to read it. Let me give you the reference for that. It's at searchforislam.com. S-E-A-R-C-H, the word for, F-O-R-I-S-L-A-M.com. Or you can put the number in there, search number for islam.com, the one will get you there. But when you get to it, type in the word harsh, H-A-R-S-H. That's all. And then you'll see a lot, many web pages will be referred to there of these harsh questions. What the answer is, and more important, how to give the answer. So that the person comes away understanding and realizing some beauty of Islam at the same time. It, it really is amazing that the people who actually used it have written to me and told me, this works like a charm. And I'm telling you, it's nothing different than what our Prophet Islam would have done. He would be happy for the chance to talk to the people. Let us take another example before I go deeper on this. Our Prophet Islam took this message of worshiping one God with no partners to a place called a taif. Anybody heard about that? Well, most of you here heard about a taif. It's not very far from Arafat. If you know where Mecca is, the road to Arafat, keep going. There's some mountains up there, make a right turn, and there you are. <laughs> That's taif. So he went there and met, or wanted to meet, with the tribal leaders. Now these people are all descendants from the same tribe, you know, way back somewhere. So because of their relationship, they should give him dignity, they should hear what he has to say, serve him, you know, tea or water, something. And as we say, roll out the red carpet because he's a dignitary, so to speak, coming from another tribe. But instead, because of the message he's carrying, because he is a prophet of Almighty Allah, look how they treat him. They said, ah, we don't want to meet with this guy. Yeah? Because if he's not who he says he is, then we're entertaining a fool. And if he is who he says he is, you know, and, you know, then we'd be in trouble anyway. So let's just turn the street urchins against him. So the people of the street, you know, like kids or whatever, pick up these rocks and they start throwing rocks. And they threw rocks on him and his companion and they had to run out of town with blood running down. So much so the blood fills his sandals. And they didn't stop running till they got close to the end of a, of a uh, orchard, or I can't think what you call it uh, in English. But when they got there, they stopped. The angel Gabriel came to him and told him that Allah can bring these mountains down on top of these people. No problem. There's an angel on either side ready to just bring them down. Just say the word, and boom, they're gone. Because, think about this, they stoned you, Allah will stone them. How's that? Did he say yes? Would you have said yes? Now remember we said you got to say the truth. <laughs> what did he say? Instead he prayed for them. Would you pray for them? Or would you curse them? <laughs> Be honest. So the teaching that we have from Islam is that you pray for your enemy. That's the first step. And that prayer for your enemy should be like his prayer. He said, may Allah guide them and from them bring those who worship Allah. Because that's the only reason he went there. The only reason he went there was to tell them to worship God without partners because they were mushrikeen. They worship idols, rocks, sticks, stones, bones, and everything else. Anything that moves or doesn't move. They're just like some of the religions we have today. And he wanted to call them to the truth. And for that, they stoned him. And for that, he prayed for them to be guided. So that's the example. And had even one of them come to him, even saying, why are you preaching this message? He would have been happy. He would have smiled 
because he had a chance to talk to them. And this is your chance to talk to somebody. But let them see Islam in you so they don't walk away saying, I'm glad that I didn't meet a Muslim first. We have more about this and we'll deal with that in a few minutes and how you respond after you say, thank you for asking me about my religion, the steps, the questions and the answers in details. So don't go away. We'll be back with more on Guide Us TV. <laughs> The first question that we have, is the Muslim God identical with the Christian and the Jewish God? Actually, we know the word is Muslim, but they wrote the term Muslim. Is the Muslim God identical with the Christian and the Jewish God? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, rasulullah. And because of the nature of our program tonight, I'm going to add a little something to the question. I'm going to ask the question to myself as though somebody is attacking Islam, okay? Not, because this is a straightforward question and there's no problem with it. It should be dealt that way. But suppose somebody said that your God is a made-up God, it's not real. You're not the same as the Christian or the Jewish God. If they said it like that, then how do you respond? And I already told you, you say, Thank you for asking me about my religion. And you smile. Don't forget the smile. If the sound. <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> like whenever you're going to take a picture and they say smile, say what? Jibna. But so somebody asks you a question like that, thank you for asking me about my religion. Then go to the next point. In Islam, it is forbidden to lie. If I don't know the answer, I have to tell you I don't know. And I'll be rewarded for that. But if I make up any answer, I will go to hell for that. The second point, we have all of the references extant today about Islam. There is nothing about Islam that we need to make up or fill in the blanks. It's all right there. What Islam teaches has been recorded, preserved, and presented for over 1400 years. There are not two versions of the Quran. There's only one. There are not two versions of Sahih Bukhari or Sahih Muslim. Just one. Even in Termidhi and the Sunan of Abu Dawud, Ibn Majid, and others, there's not two versions. Although they will tell you this one is weaker than this one, this is so and so, that's exactly preservation itself to demonstrate the value of authentication or rawaya of Islam. So many people don't know that. Now, some Arab Christians and Arab Jews, they realize that they understand that. But for the vast majority of people in the world, even some Muslims, don't know how important it is to be able to refer back to exactly what Islam really does teach. Because if you do that, you yourself will benefit, and it makes it really easy to answer a question properly. All right? So those are the two points you must convey after you say, Thank you for asking me about my religion. Now, if the statement is incorrect, then you want to help them understand the statement's incorrect. For instance, if they said, your Allah is not the God of the Jews and Christians. If they said that, then you could say, well, thank you for asking me about my religion. In Islam, we have the truth and the proof. I summed that for you. You know what to do there. But let me share with you that some questions are not questions. They are statements with a question mark. If somebody could ask you a question and say, will you answer me with a yes or no question? Will you do that? You say yes, of course. Is your mother out of jail? Huh? Is your mother out of the jail yet? What? My mother's not, uh, 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 yes or no. How can I answer this question? My mother's never been, uh, 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 uh. Is she in or out of jail? She's out. 
Good, I'm glad she got out. <laughs> so you see, the question actually had a statement that's false. And you can't properly deal with it unless you break it down and look at it from the source, and that's why it's important to know the source. So let us consider. You asked about Allah. Is Allah the same Allah for the Christians and the Jews? Well, the way to find out is to see in the Quran is the word Allah used. Huh? Well, I will tell you that in my own personal experience of going through and looking, I've found thousands, not hundreds, thousands of times the word Allah, Lillah, or a form of it, like Allahumma, etc., you find this word Allah. Many, 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 many times. So it's there. In fact, it happens to be in the very first opening, Bismillah, in the name of Allah, and that's at the beginning of every surah, except Surah At-Tawbah, and it makes up for it in another surah, where it is a letter written by Suleiman to Bilqis, and he said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and I think everybody knows that here. But for sure, the word Allah, Alif, Lam Lam Ha, is represented again and again and again and again throughout the Quran and the Hadith, etc. So we know we use it. But what about the Jews and Christians? One came to me and he said, how come you say Allah, why don't you say God like normal people? I said, what? Yeah, everybody else says God. I'm talking about a guy in Texas, you can figure, you know. You remember Bush. <laughs> yep. Anyhow, I asked them, do you think all the Christians say God? Yeah, sure they do. All the Christians say God, yeah. In Spanish? Well, they don't kill. Well, actually, in Spanish, you have more people who use this word Dios than you have people that speak English. What? Yes. Because in Latin, and that's where their Bible is coming from, and Spanish, and Italian, Portuguese, Francais, all of these languages have a word for their deity, and it's not God. Well, the guy's sitting there going, really? Somebody needs to wake them up. <laughs> really? I said, do you think that the prophets said that word God? Sure they did, it's in the Bible. In the Bible. King James. Okay. Did you know that that was in 1611? Uh, no. Yeah. It was translated to English in 1611, to English. Did you know there was no English before the year 1066 A.D.? Huh? I'm asking you, do you think Jesus spoke English? Sure, he's God, he can speak anything. <laughs> Thank you for asking me about my religion. Have a nice day. <laughs> the word God did not exist at the time of revelation of any scripture, including the Quran. Nobody could have said God because it wasn't there yet. Oops. Well, after that, he was ready to listen to what I had to say. I said, I want you to go to any hotel or motel in the United States, Canada, and open the drawer right beside the bed. What are you going to find in that drawer? Well, you know about that. All right, you take it out. This is placed by the Gideon Society, and they've translated to 27 languages, including Arabic. And you can thumb through the first seven pages, and you'll find samples, examples of the language they translated it into. They translated it from English into these languages, which means what? It's not, <laughs> that's not worth a lot, is it? No. Because you're just taking this translation and put it in another one. The first one is Afrikaans language, which is a form of German. The second one is Arabia. The second one is Arabic. And what did they translate? This is from the book of John, chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world 
And what does it say in Arabic? It said, for Allah so loved the world. Alif, Lam, Lam, Ha. So, there it is. Now, what do you come back with? Oh, wah, 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 wah. I have the Arabic Bible printed in a place called Lebanon. Have you heard of Lebanon? Oh, that's where we are, isn't it? And it says on page one for Genesis that it is Allah who created the heavens and the earth. It is Allah that created the first light. It is Allah. And the word Allah is 17 times on page one. There are 17 verses, and coincidentally, 17 times it says Allah in Arabic. So what do you say about that? You know what he said? Somebody needs to talk to those Gideon guys and tell them to put God in there. The fact is that people have been saying the word Allah all the way back before recorded history. That is the Arabic word for the deity. Not just for Jews and Christians or Muslims, but even for the mushrikeen themselves. It was the word used. Because if you doubt what I just told you, go back and look at the hadith about people named Abdullah, who were not Muslims. That they were named Abdullah. Abdullah. So the word was common. The word itself is common. But what's not common is the concept, and that's where the problem came in. In this case, you can use the example, if you have time to talk to them and tell them, that it was the very thing that upset the families and tribes of Muhammad, peace be upon him, before he was the prophet, they loved him. They all loved him. They had so much respect for him. They called him as the truthful. They called him Alameen, which is the trustworthy. They called him by the highest names, had the highest respect. There was nothing about him except it was good. He never drank. He never went to, let's say, parties. Let's leave it at that. He didn't engage with anything evil whatsoever. And they all knew that. He was a virgin at 25 when he married his wife. Now, how many people at that time, I mean, you know, come on, give me a break. So, in light of that, imagine when he went up on top of the mount and he said, or called actually, the tribes, come on, Benny so-and-so, come on, Benny so-and-so, this one and that one. He called the tribes in a manner that they used to call if there was a war coming on. And they saw him up there on this mound, and they saw him crying out. They said, okay, something's wrong, let's go. And they show up, some of them even had their weapons ready to go, you know, uh, what's going on? He said, if I told you there's an army on the other side of this hill marching on us right now, would you believe me? They said, yeah, yeah, who is it? Let's go get them, you know. He said, no. Would you believe me? Yeah, you're the truthful, go ahead, who is it, what is it? He said, then, I got a message. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. I said, honor Rasulullah, and I'm the messenger of Allah. So why, all of a sudden, they turned against him. All of them, ah, this is what you call us out for? Ah. They became angry. Why would they be angry? In fact, many of them used the word Allah already. What upset them? Because when he said, la ilaha, that's the problem in Arabic. It means there is no deity. There's nothing to worship. Illallah, except Allah. And they understood it clear. And they reject that message instantly because of a number of reasons. One, their traditions, their forefathers, their culture. Another is the economics associated with it because everybody used to come to Mecca for no other reason than to do tawaf. Some of them even taking their clothes off and doing tawaf going around the Kaaba. That's what they did. And that was a religious ceremony that all these different people did. Idolaters, mushrikeen, didn't matter who it was. Whoever came, the Arabs, they would do that. And then they came, they had their caravan so they could do horse trading, as we call it in Texas. Trade out, do this, do that. So it was a monetary interest that they had in this, and they were concerned about that. So that was the real reason for their rejection. It wasn't that they were mad at him. 
They were mad at the message itself. And so that's the idea that we have when we talk about la ilaha illallah. It is the concept. There isn't any God in this creation. Not Muhammad, not Jesus, not Moses, not any human being, not any animal, not any plant, not any rock, not any star, not any moon. There is nothing in the creation of Allah worthy of my worship, only Allah. And if he wants to carry it to another level, let's just look in your Bible. What does it say in Exodus 20? Very clear. You cannot have any partners at all in worship with Allah. It says it more or less like this. I'm the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the house of bondage. Because they were slaves. The Israelites were slaves. And you know no God beside me. Beside me there's no other God. That's three times. Now watch this. Thou shalt not have any other gods beside me. Is that clear? How clear do you want to be? And the prophets who brought that message were rejected by the Israelites too. Many of their prophets they killed. Read the Old Testament. It says they killed them. Read the story of Elijah. Read the story of Elisha. Read the stories of the prophets and you will see for yourself. They had to run for their lives. And only because of this message. Worship God. Don't worship what he created. So if they said, well, that's the Old Testament. And I've had them do that to me. Say, that's the Old Testament. You know, the New Testament. What, you got a new God? It's the same God. Yeah, but he decided to do this. He changed that a little, whatever. But still, in the book of Mark, chapter 12, verse 29, they asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Amr Kabira. What is the biggest commandment? It is to know, O Israel. And I like this because it relates to Akidah. It is to know, O Israel, that the Lord your God is Wahid. One God. And you have to love Him with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. And a commandment like unto it to love your brother as yourself. And if that's not the message of Islam, then I totally misunderstood all the way around. Because first is your relationship with Allah. Second, it should be reflected in the way you treat the people. And if you can do that, then you, Muslims, and you, Christians, should be just happy as clams. And then let Allah worry about what your aqidah is on the Day of Judgment. Because if you're doing that, there's no reason to attack each other anymore. But be honest, the real reason is because we have other vested interests. That's more than that. There is always some and that goes with it, you know? And my house, and my money, and my job, and my position, and, 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 and. And that's where the problem comes in. Or you can simply say, nuffs, nuffs, nuffs. This is a very long answer because it is giving you the example on how to give an answer. But be sure that all along the way you give them time to talk. If he wants to talk, be quiet and let them finish. It's hard because you want to interrupt and say, no, but let him finish. And then you have your proof. And if you don't have your proof, in the English language, I have it for you, inshallah, on a website called God, Allah. Dot com. Read it, read the articles, copy what you like, check out the videos, the audios that are there, and see what you think. You're most welcome. The next question, Sheikh, what would you do in the case of one who is considering Islam but are hesitating to revert or convert to Islam? Right here, right now. I want to look at this word Islam. I want, I want to really take a moment to think about what does Islam really mean. When I was 17 years old, and you know, I think a lot of boys go through this about that age, where you have all your difficulties and problems, I found something really nice 
that I could recite from my Bible that made me feel good. It was called the Lord's Prayer. I enjoyed reciting that. I memorized it early in my life, and it came in so handy many times. But I became very conscious of it in those days, and I could just think for a second and have the whole thing just almost play automatically in my head. It begins with one word that a Muslim might not like to hear. It says our father because we don't think God is a father or a mother, but rather the creator of all the fathers and mothers. But after that, listen to these beautiful words. Which art in heaven? Where's the law? Okay, right? You point up, in heaven, wherever. So, that's the first part. Hallowed be thy name. Well, Allah has 99 names that we consider very hallowed, very sacred. It's the word Quds. In fact, look at how this word plays into the names of Allah itself. Al Qudus. Wow. Then it continues. Now, this is in the Bible. This is in the New Testament twice. This is what Jesus told his companions how to pray. Your kingdom come, God's kingdom. Your will be done, God's will. Allahu ala kulli shayin qadir. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the word Islam. That's the meaning behind Islam. Do what God wants you to do. Stop doing what you want to do. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as, on earth like it is in heaven. Then give us this day our daily bread. Rizka. Ya rizak. And forgive us of our sins or trespasses as we forgive those who do sin against us. You're asking Allah for maghfir. And you're forgiving other people. We talked about that already. You have to forgive people. And they have to forgive you. And you ask Allah to forgive all of us. What a beautiful thing. Anything wrong with that? Think about it. So if a Christian and a Muslim are saying the same words, how about the end of Ayatul Kursi? You know what? Wasiya Kursi Yahusum Wati Bawak Wala Yauduhu Hiftahuma Wahul Ali Uladim. And look how the Lord's Prayer is ending. You know how have you heard it? Because the very end of it, give us this day our daily bread, the risk. Forgive us our trespasses, we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Don't lead us to the way of what? Mabdubi alayhim, what a darling. Very close. It almost says guide us. It doesn't, but it gets close. Deliver us from evil. What do you say when you go to the bathroom? When you walk in the bathroom, what do you ask Allah? Protect me from any evil when I go in the bathroom. What do you say before you recite the Quran? I will believe in the shaitan regime. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Is that beautiful? The problem is, neither one of us really study our religion or practice it. That's the problem. How would you respond to someone who called you a terrorist? The rest of the story about what I was talking about, the converting to Islam, I got off the subject. I need to finish that. And I'll come back to it in a few minutes. Okay, but I wanted to take these one by one. I have been called a terrorist. When I was putting gas in my car one time, some guy went by and he hollered, yeah, terrorists, go back to your country. I'm from Texas. <laughs> what do you want me to do? <laughs> Maybe I look like Bush. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. My wife is the one who actually responded. Just recently, just uh, a few weeks ago, she was said she was in a grocery store. She was buying some groceries. And the lady ahead was talking to the checkout lady, you know. 
And she was saying, oh, why did they let these people shop here? Why don't they go back to their country? Now, my wife wears the face veil, so you can't see her face. You don't know what she really looks like. But you know what she sounds like. She said, what'd you say? <laughs> she said, I'm not talking to you. She said, no, you're talking about me. I'm in that conversation. She said, no, you're not. Yes, I am. She said, I'm not talking to you. She said, yes, you are. She's from Texas, too. <laughs> she said, I'm from Texas. She said, I'm not talking to you. She said, you're talking about me. You need to learn something about Islam before you open your mouth. Now, I don't recommend that, okay? <laughs> I'm not rec I'm just telling you. Because it said, how do you deal with it? I'm telling you how she dealt with it. One time somebody asked her, why are you wearing that face cover? She said, because I don't have any lips. <laughs> then she says, try to say lips without lips. <laughs> My daughter was asked that one time, and she was a young girl, but she wanted to wear the face cover like mom, you know. So they were asking her, why do you have a face cover? She said, so I can stick my tongue and you don't know it. <laughs> Another Texan. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> but actually, if somebody calls you a terrorist, that's when you really need to use, thank you for asking me about my religion. Because when they see the smile and hear you say that, they're going to be going, huh? Because they were expecting you to start a fight. But so you're showing, showing them something nice. And while you're doing it, start making dua for them. Oh Allah, let them see some truth. Let them see something nice from me. And then gently, we always have to tell the truth. Or say, I don't know. Or we can be in trouble with Allah. And we have the evidence for everything. So what you like to bring, let's have a look at it. See what it is. And please, if you know something that I don't know, tell me. I want to remind you of something I said the other night. That the one who brought me to Islam told me and told my friend, the Catholic priest, that if your religion is better than my religion, I'm ready to go to it. But the one thing you need is proof. You need to have more proof than we have, and I'm ready to go. Initially, when I thought about it, I thought, well, it's better because Christianity, you don't have to pray five times a day, you don't have to fast Ramadan, there's a lot of stuff you don't have to do. It should be nice, but what is the mandatory thing in Christianity, as far as I know, is what you say, Jesus died for your sins, and you're good to go. It's easy. But when you get down to the proof or the evidence and want to really check it out, that's when you begin to understand. The evidence in Islam, and I don't want to turn this into a, a course about how to you know, verify hadith, but the evidence in Islam is something that is so admired throughout history that it has been copied again and again and again for testable evidence. It really wasn't until the time of these great scholars who were, by the way, I don't know if you know this, they were in Uzbekistan. How many of you knew that? Yeah, that's where it really happened. So we hear about Uzbekistan today, former Soviet Union. It's much older than that. It's former great scholars of Islam. Tashkent is where the big museum is. It has one of the oldest Qurans and writing in the world. But it also has today some of those who directly learned from those great scholars who memorized and memorized and memorized. There is not two versions of the Quran on the planet. There isn't. Everywhere I've been, everybody starts out with Bismillah Rahman Rahim and they end with Minal Janati Wannas. And it's always in Arabic. And although there's some pronunciation differences on certain words, it's always the same meaning, no difference. I, I want to make that point clear to the Muslims because sometimes you have a tendency to take it for granted you don't realize what you have in your hands or in your heart. So, as far as somebody wanting to come to Islam, 
That's between them and Allah. That really is between them and Allah. If they want to do it, really do it, then they already did it. The Prophet he said, Innama amala bin niyah. For sure, every action is predicated by the intention, and the intention is what you can be rewarded for. Nothing more or less. You have a good intention, you have a good deed. This is very clear in Islam. So if somebody has that intention, maybe they were on their way to a mosque to make their shahada and they died. Allah is not going to cancel them out, is he? Of course not. So that idea is already in place. Then there is something that Islam asks them to do as soon as they can, which is to make a formal shahada to declare it in front of somebody. And if you're on a desert island, just say it out loud, Allah is your witness. Allah is the shaheed for you. He is your witness. But if you can do it in front of other witnesses, it's good. But it doesn't stop somebody from being a Muslim just because there's nobody around when they want to do it. To be a Muslim, though, it takes some action. There is what we mentioned, silva, which is the connection five times a day, salawat al -tums. For ladies, there's the exception during their monthly cycle. The ladies will explain that to you if you want to know more about it. Then for the Ramadan is the same thing. We fast every single day. Again, the ladies get that exception during that time. And the fasting is from the time just before the sun comes up till just after it goes down. There is zakah, which is not a tax on the wealth in the sense as it comes in, but the wealth as it's held for a period of a year or more. Once you've held something for a year, it's taxable 2.5%. But what you make on your income is never taxable. But if you give some of it to people in Sadaqa, this is very highly appreciated and big reward for you. Finally, we have something called Hajj, and that is the pilgrimage. Once in the lifetime, a person makes the journey to Mecca, go through the rituals which were performed initially by Abraham himself and his son and what they called to and it was revived over the centuries several times by other prophets but now with Muhammad Sassanam it's finite and we don't change that. So that should give you some idea of what the rituals are. What do the Muslims believe? First and foremost Muslims believe in Allah as we've already diagrammed again and again and again. There's only one Allah. He has no partners. And we look, we look to Allah for everything we need. We depend on Allah and we ask from Him only. The second thing is that we believe in the malayaka, the angels, because the angels, they perform many of the tasks that Allah sets them out to do. The angels, they're made out of light and you don't see them, but that doesn't mean they're not there. So we believe in the angels and we believe in the books. Be careful about this subject because if you said we believe in all the books, then this would indicate that you believed in the books as they exist today. We do not believe in the Qur'an if it's translated. Do we? Of course not. That's not from Allah. So therefore, we don't accept any books except the originals, which don't exist today. But we know originally they came from Allah through various prophets like Moses, like David, Suleiman, Jesus Christ, peace be upon them. And then we believe in all the messengers. We don't make any distinction between any of the messengers. All of the messengers of Allah, they are a high status with us. They don't make the major sins, masiyah. They don't. Anything it says they did, we disregard it because we know they couldn't have done those horrible things that some people said. We would not accept that. And we would put Jesus in the highest level of the prophets. But we would not make him a god or a son of a god. Nor would we with Muhammad either. 
on the subject of Jesus. Christians like to know what you believe. We believe in the miracle birth of Jesus, but we also believe in the miracle of Adam being born out of mud and the miracle of Hawa, Eve, coming out of Adam with no mother. And we don't worship them either. So that's not a, a reason to worship them. We believe in the miracles that were performed by Jesus by the will of Allah. But we also believe in miracles that were with Moses, with Ezekiel, and other prophets. And of course, the miracles that came with Muhammad. We believe in these prophets in the highest level of any human, no doubt. We also believe in the Akhirah, and there is a day of judgment, and there are people who will go to paradise, some people will go to hell, some people will get out of hell and go to paradise. But nobody will be taken out of paradise and thrown in hell, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. So, when we understand that, we find now that the, even in the Quran, it tells us about the early Christians and early Jews, definitely who followed their prophet, they will go to paradise. So we don't have this problem of saying only us, only us. It's not exclusive at all. For those who understand and follow their prophet at that time, they are good to go, inshallah, up to Allah. And then finally, we believe in the qadr of Allah. Everything is by Allah's will, not by you, but by Him. And what He wills, will happen. This is Islam. If you already believe that and ready to put the actions that I already mentioned in place, then inshallah you're good to go. Alhamdulillah, you can be a Muslim. مع افتتاح عامها العشرين من بر الداعيات تطل عليكم بثوبها المتجدد جديدها لهذا العام صناعة الحضارة هو وهي شباب بنات نسمة حرية ربيع الشباب حكايا شبابية منبر الدعيات للكلمة الحرة عنوان All right, he said we have some more questions and I think I, I was going to try to wrap up and because I know some people it looks like you've got to leave go somewhere. I don't know, maybe it's a special ball game on tonight, you know. <laughs> I want to see it too. Anyway, <laughs> for sure, uh, we want to answer as many questions as we can, but I want to keep coming back to the context of dealing with misconceptions. Go ahead. Why does Islam order such severe punishments as cutting the hand to the thief and giving ten lashes for adultery? Ten? Ten, yeah, that's a discount. <laughs> missing a zero. It's a hundred, not ten. This is exactly what I was looking for. Jazakallah for giving us this one. Because that's the kind of harsh question and misconception that comes together, and it's perfect. Why does Islam order you to cut off people's hand or beat them a hundred times for adultery? Thank you for asking me about my religion. <laughs> Because in Islam, we have to tell the truth. And if we don't know, we have to say, I don't know. But the evidence is clear. And if I lie, I'm going to hell and I don't want that. So this is what you can rely on. If you've got a real Muslim in front of you, you're going to get the real story. Or else you'll say, I don't know, let's go ask the sheikh and find out. But let's ask this way, instead of saying why, let's say does. Does Islam order me to chop off hands, beat people up, and you forgot one? Cut off heads. What happened? You forgot that one? You had room on the paper. You should have put that one on there. 
cut off the head, cut off the head. Some people have their heads cut off. <gasps> Did you know that? Some people have their heads cut off. In fact, if you study French history, the history of France, you'll find a whole lot of royal people had their heads cut off all on the same day. And they weren't even Muslim, darn. <laughs> What does Islam teach us? First and foremost, it teaches us about integrity, balance, honesty, rights. So let's find out now how come all of a sudden there's some kind of corporal punishment, physical punishment being distributed here. Suppose somebody steals a loaf of bread, you cut off his hand, yeah? Is that really true? A guy doesn't want to be a Muslim anymore? Cut off his head. They told me when I came to Islam, somebody who was not Muslim, he told me, you don't want to get in that. They're going to cut you up. When you go in, you have to be circumcised. <laughs> and if you go back out, they'll cut your head off. So either way, in or out, you're getting cut up. <laughs> Pretty scary religion. I, I, I really heard that. So I went to the one who brought me to Islam and I asked him, I wasn't Muslim yet, I asked him, I heard something about cutting off people's heads and stuff. <laughs> and at that time, it was 1991, there was an article in one of the religious journals, Christian journal, talking about Islam and somebody's getting their head cut off. And it was in Egypt. And I said, oh my God. So I showed him this. I said, what do you say about that? He said, well, if you notice, it didn't say that it happened. It said that most likely this is going to happen. So it's not a fact. This is an allegation being levied at Islam by somebody who is in another religion. I said, well, okay, that's fair. But what would you do if a person wants to leave Islam? He said, well, what they really do in Egypt is they will sit with the person and talk to them about it and find out what is it that you didn't like? What is it that you don't believe in? What's the problem? If you just said, well, um, in Islam you have to believe in Jesus. Well, in Christianity you have to believe in Jesus too. So what, what's the problem? And step by step, they would go with them. And he said that even then, Egypt doesn't chop people's heads off for leaving Islam. Some people take it, the law into their own hands. But I found it to be true both ways. If somebody converted from being a Christian in Egypt to become a Muslim in Egypt, they could also be killed by their own relatives out of uh, uh, animosity that's coming from uh, tradition and culture. You just ruined our whole family. You did this, you did that. So that doesn't mean Islam or Christianity did it. It means the people took the law into their own hands. But when it comes to this subject, let's take one that's a, a little bit more, I think, uh, applicable, is the discussion about why cut off the hand of a thief. Why? Who would be worried about that? Are you really worried that somebody's going to cut off your hand? Because if you are, then what kind of living are you making? What are you doing for a living that, that scares you? And who are the people going to speak the loudest about this kind of thing? Huh? Who? Lawyers and politicians. <laughs> And we don't have this in Islam, but if they said they would cut off your tongue if you lied, then all the journalists would hate Islam immediately. You follow that? So it's the one who does these things that's going to be more afraid than anybody else. But if you're not a thief, how many of you think it's nice to have a thief in your family? Huh? 
Have you had any of your relatives steal something from you? Well, in America, it happens all the time. When people use drugs, they lose their connection with anything else. They don't care about anything else anymore. And they need the drug, they need the drug more than anything, and they will do anything to anybody to get the money for the drug. They will do it, and that's known. So how many thieves do you think we have in America? Every day, stealing and stealing and stealing and stealing and stealing to fight this problem they have inside of themselves needing that drug. And the more drug they take, the more they have to have the next day, the next day, till they kill themselves or go insane. That's drugs. So should you chop off their hand? And what about the guy that steals the loaf of bread? He's hungry. People steal food when they're hungry. Actually, Islam wouldn't cut off the hand of either one of them. Because the one has a mental disorder, needs to be treated. The other one is hungry. Islam provides something called the Beit al-Mal. Anybody can eat anytime and they don't have to be a Muslim. They can get all the food, clothing, and even shelter that they need. It's a social system when there is the full Islamic state. But when there's not an Islamic state, it's not available. And that means that full Islamic Sharia cannot be practiced. You must never call for Sharia and the punishment that goes with that unless you've established the environment for it first. Because there are pluses that are not there. You don't, you don't provide people with the food and then you're going to chop off hands for stealing food. That's stupid. And Islam doesn't allow that. So you have to know what the limits are. And that's why I mentioned that in the beginning. You have to understand too that a, an average person like me or Sheikh here, we're not muftis, we're not going to make that kind of call. It's a judge, a qadi in Islam, who has memorized the whole Quran, memorized all the hadith. He's somebody that's there at Fajr every morning to pray his prayers. He's somebody who cares about the community. And he's going to be looking at the one who employed the man who stole the food to find out how come this man's stealing food. I'm going to look at the employer. How come this man didn't get paid? If anybody else from your employ, people that you hire, is hungry, you're not paying, and they're working, I need to talk to you, because you're the one going to be in trouble, not them. You have to understand that Islam comes from some very beautiful logic, but some people don't understand how to implement it. And so that's what we see again and again and again. We don't see the mercy, and we don't see the compassion, and we don't see the authority, the proper authority being represented when people go out here and start beating each other up. As far as the hundred lashes for the adulterer, there's a difference between adultery and fornication. Fornication is what occurs between boys and girls that are not married. Adultery is what occurs between a man who is married and a woman, or a woman who is married and a man that is not married to him. So that's the difference. And there is a different punishment. But here's the trick behind it. Listen to this. Suppose somebody said they saw fornication. We're not going to talk about adultery here because this would be even higher. But just, just that, and it's more common fornication than adultery in all the societies. So a couple guys come along and they say, we saw so and so and such and such and they were doing this. Oh really? You saw them? Yes. You saw them. You didn't just hear a rumor. No, we saw it. Okay? So they go to the judge and they say it and they swear it and you saw them. They were under a sheet or blanket? Yeah, okay, you didn't see them. No, this is serious, this is very serious. You didn't see them. But we saw when they got out from under the blanket, but you didn't see the act that you're talking about. So these people are the ones who are actually whipped. Did you know that? They're the ones who get the spanking publicly. And then their testimony is not accepted anymore. If they said, okay, we saw it. 
We saw it. And we saw everything. Everything. Exactly. Clear shot. I don't know if you know much about this, but even in a video, those X-rated videos, it's really hard for anybody to get a clear shot. <laughs> Let it go at that. So these guys, two guys, are saying they saw that, swearing, putting their names to it, swearing on the Quran, everything, okay? Say, okay, produce two more witnesses. Huh? Because you have to have four eyewitnesses. And they have to know the guy, and they have to know the girl, and they have to describe what they saw, and it better match up. Now I've got a question for you. What kind of boy and girl are out there doing this in front of witnesses like that? Sound like a sideshow to me. Huh? So in the case of somebody making X-rated videotapes, yeah, they'd be beat for that. You got it. Yep, no doubt. Because this is a destruction of society itself. There's no doubt about that. They would be punished. Now when it comes to adultery, this is more severe because it's more severe damage. Much more severe because now you could have children as a result of this who are not the child of the proper parent. And this is a big problem, a big issue in inheritance, being raised up, bloodline, getting married to somebody and then finding, oh, that was your own half-sister, something like that. So those things are stronger because the crime is stronger. And by the way, how many of the ladies are married right now? Just raise your hand. Just you're married. Yeah? Married? Okay. Have you ever heard what a lady said, if I ever caught my husband do something like this, I would... Starts with a K, next letter's I, and the next two letters are alike, and they're not S's. <laughs> and in Islam, she does not have the right to kill him. That's spelled out in Surah An-Nur, I think, yeah. Because it says clearly, that if he brings evidence against his own wife and she says no, and he says yes, she says no, yes, no, and they're swearing on the day of judgment, I'm saying the truth, even if I go to hell, I'm saying, you know, I'm saying the truth. Then that's sufficient, no more. Court's not involved. So even the testimony of a spouse claiming they saw it, is not enough to bring about the court's punishment, but Allah's punishment for sure going to be on them. So stop and think before you say that kind of stuff. And realize that the courts that we have set up today are far worse because human beings have a tendency to put their own feelings on a situation and they will overly punish some man or some woman because of their own feeling and emotion but they'll let somebody else walk for the exact same crime simply because of some reshwa going on or worse. So do realize that this is from your creator, this is not human beings. But the compassion comes first and all the scholars that I ever read about said it's better to err in the leniency and the compassion than it is to be too tough and put the full hadood out there when it maybe shouldn't be. So consider that before you come attacking Islam and realize that it's for the betterment of the whole society. All of us are benefiting from the laws of Islam, not uh, laws of human beings. Sheikh, we have quite a few questions left and I think that we would like to perhaps uh, go to one that would be a benefit for everyone in the room and perhaps bring this evening to a close. And what we will do is take all the questions that have been given and inshallah ta'ala check through our uh, websites and make sure that those questions will be answered inshallah ta'ala. For those of you who would like to write Sheikh Youssef, you can write him at contact at guideus.tv. That's C-O-N-T-A-C-T at guideus.tv. And we would like to thank our local organizing groups for inviting us to come over to Beirut, Lebanon, and to visit the other cities here, showing us the wonderful hospitality that you have. And we hope, inshallah ta'ala, we'll have an opportunity to return 
and and visit with you again in the near future, inshallah ta'ala. Now, this, question? Yes, the next question uh, that we have, how does one strengthen one's faith on a daily basis other than through dua or salah? I'm going to change the question a little bit because I want to make it relative to our subject about misconceptions. Because strengthening your faith, what is faith all about? The idea behind religion is to have a way in the next life to be saved. Salvation. In English we use the word salvation. <clears throat> and it's happened to me that people have come to me and said, you don't have salvation in Islam. There's no salvation. Where's your salvation? You have to do all this stuff, and then even then, after you do all this stuff, you're not sure you're saved. What Muslim can guarantee they're going to go to paradise? Sure, sure, I'm going. I don't have anything to worry about. No, we can't. True? Absolutely true. If you ask me, I want to come to your religion, what do you got a guarantee for me? The only thing I can guarantee you is hellfire. That I can guarantee it's very easy to go to hell in Islam. Very easy. In fact, the hellfire will be started with Muslims. Scholars of Islam. Yes or no? Yes. Because they preached it, but they didn't live it. So that's a hadith of Rasul Islam. Allah will start the hellfire with these scholars of Islam who said it, but they didn't follow it. Very dangerous. So where's the salvation? This is getting scarier, you know? <coughs> we already mentioned one of the most important parts is to have evidence to be sure that what you're saying, you can back it up. We're positive of what we said. It's easier to go to hell than it is to go to paradise. In fact, <coughs> In fact, look how Allah said it in one of the smallest surahs in the Quran. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Wal asr in al-insan la fi khusr. Allah swore by the passage of time that the human beings are all destined for the hellfire because they're in a state of bankruptcy, khusr on the yawm al-qiyam on the day of judgment. All of them. Illa. Oh, this is your salvation. This is your only salvation in Islam. Illa ladina amanu wa amilu salahati wa tawassaw bil haqqi wa tawassaw bil sabr. Except for those who come to the correct iman in Allah and do the deeds of righteousness and exhort each other to the haqq of la ilaha illallah and all that it teaches and exhort each other to be patient, steadfast, persevering on that deen. Other than that, la fi khus. That is the Qur'an. That is Surah Al-Asr. And it is so clear that Imam Shafi, Rabbi he said about it, that if it was all that Allah gave us, it's enough to understand the basis of our deen our religion of Islam. It's very clear. The salvation is what? Illa ladina amanu. Believing in the Creator, turning to the Creator, going to the Creator, and not using something between you and Him. And doing the deeds of righteousness. And that doesn't mean a good deed a day, you know, like a Boy Scout or something like that. It's in all that you do, your amalat, how you deal with the people, Muslim or non-Muslim, how you deal with your relatives, how you deal with your boss and your customers, how you deal with the animals, how you deal with the creation itself, even trees and flowers, even water. Prophet ﷺ mentioned all of these things. You read the hadith. There are hundreds of thousands of hadith out there. Many of them are sahih. Some are considered hasan, which means they could be a weakness in the way that it's said. But you read these and you'll be surprised again and again and again that always come back to the same thing. If you're really a Muslim, it's about belief and action. And that's what it takes. You want to increase your faith? 
That's what you have to know. So if somebody comes to you and says, what's your salvation in Islam? Or do you have any salvation? Thank you for asking me about my religion. In Islam, we have absolutely need for truth. And if I can't do that, I need to shut up and just say, I don't know. But if I know, I have to tell you. And we have it based only on Quran and Sunnah. We don't have our own opinion. If it's not Kala Allah wa Kala Rasul, then shut up. We don't need it. We don't need, that's pontification, rhetoric, and we don't need it. We want to hear what Allah said. We want to hear what the Prophet said. Or an explanation. When you do translation, you have to really work on it because Arabic is very strong, very strong. And English is very weak when it comes to these matters. That's why I spend a lot of time taking a word and making sure people understand it. And me too. Because for sure, real Islam is nothing different than what Jesus taught, what Moses taught, what Abraham taught, what Adam himself lived by. It is to know that if there's only one God, obey him. And most important, when you sin, and you will sin, and here's your salvation, repent to him and him alone. Go back to a law. Make tawbah. Like a U-turn in the middle of the street. Go back to a law. Go back to the one who cre created you in the first place. Put your head on the ground. Raise your hand up to him. Allah. Allah. Forgive me. I'm sorry. I did it to myself. I'm wrong. La ilaha illa ante subhanaka in kuntum mimidalameen. That's Islam. And that's the salvation. I've been reminded just now that there are some people in our audience who wanted to accept Islam tonight. I knew about that earlier, and that's why I deferred the question because I didn't want to answer it just then. <laughs> but I want to make it easy for them. I don't want to bring them up here and put them on the stage, and I don't want to put them in front of the camera because we don't need that. I don't need that. I know that there is a video out there that shows me giving shahado to a bunch of people at that big peace conference in Dubai. I'm aware of that. I saw it translated to Arabic. And frankly, although I cry when I see it, I don't like the idea that people are using it the way they do, as though it's the only person ever made shahada or that I'm something big too. It's not. There are people that make shahada every day and you never heard of them. And there are people that give shahada every day and you don't know them either. And it really doesn't matter. What matters is, are we trying to get the real message of Islam out there? And when people enter Islam, and this is really key, somebody wants to be a Muslim, are you ready to help them? I dare say, and I don't know this, but I guess here, right now in Beirut, if somebody said they wanted to be a Muslim, that would be a very big thing for them. Because they would be going against traditions of their families for who knows how many hundreds of years. And what kind of difficulties would they face when they go back to their friends, their relatives? What would they be looking at when their families find out, oh, you became a, one of those terrorists, just like that, right? How would they feel? They might lose their job, if they had one. They might lose their home, be kicked out. That happens in the States, by the way. Are we really prepared to help our new brothers and sisters? Because we find that that's the real problem. After they get in Islam, they get this bad treatment. Now we'll come back to that first question we had. Remember that one? Uh, who remembers? It says about, I wish, huh? I would know Islam before I meet the Muslims. I'm saying, I wish everybody could meet Muslims like I met. And then they'd all want to be like you. So let's do this tonight. For anybody here who has never said shahada out loud, Muslim or non-Muslim, but you believe there really is one God and you want to serve him on his terms according to the way of Muhammad, then you can simply stand up with myself and Sheikh here and we're going to repeat our shahada. You can join us and that makes it real easy for the new people to join right along with us and do their shahada.
It will count for them, and it doesn't put pressure on anybody. It's not my flag. I'm going to put it up. Whoa! The whole room is standing up? How many people are here? We only have five books, so it has to go to the, to the mountains. <laughs> Okay, for somebody who never said Shahada before tonight, not Muslim, it's coming tonight, you stay after because we got some gifts for you up here. After, after, okay? It's because we don't know we got seven books now, eight, nine, all right. But, if we, but for those who come up afterwards, that if they don't have enough, I'm gonna make sure, inshallah, that they will help you out, give you the books. And we have some other goodies too, right? Yeah, what about Mus'haf? You got Mus'haf? Muntada. Okay, inshallah. And I think, well, we'll do it in English first. And then we'll do the Arabic. Okay? You want the English? I bear witness. I bear witness. There's none worthy of worship. There's none worthy of worship. Except Allah. Except Allah. And I bear witness. And I bear witness. That Muhammad. That Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Is the messenger of Allah. If you're now the Arabia with Texas accent. <laughs> Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Wa Isa Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Allahu Akbar. 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 Allah